following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Let the dry land appear. Following the sequence of the lectures that we are giving related with the book of Genesis, which is a book of alchemy, we are today entering into the mysteries of what we call matter. Remember that this word in Latin means mother. And uh, as you see in the graphic, this is what uh, the third day of Genesis states in relation with the crystallization <coughs> of the matter into a concrete aspect, being it abstract before, of course, of its concrete manifestation. The Bible explains that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Earth here is this matter that we are talking about. But uh, the book of Genesis specify very clear that before this uh, earth was uh, empty and without form, or as it is stated in the Hebrew language, tohu bevohu which means formless and void. When we investigate this formless, formless and void matter or earth, then we discover the earth in its chaotic aspect or formless within the void. When we imagine the void, we imagine the space, the nothingness. It is what in Kabbalah is called Ein Sof, which means uh, endless. Space. or limitless space. This means that uh, matter itself exists in its abstract manner, without form. And uh, it is, we will say, diluted in the space. If we want to find this formless matter without form, we find it in all the space, or in all the infinite space. 
It wa is what uh, in Sanskrit is called akash. The akash is a blue substance, blue dark substance that inundates the entire space. And this Akash is precisely what we call the Ain Sof, together with the, with the space where we find uh, what in Sanskrit is called prana, or energy. And what in Kabbalah, in the Hebrew language, is symbolized by the letter Shin which means fire, or symbolizes fire. You can see this letter in the second uh, line of this graphic where we find the word Eheye Asher Eheye, which means I become who becomes. And that is translated in the book of Exodus in the Bible as I am that what I am. Because it relates to the same thing. So, this is what in Kabbalah is called the CET. See that this word CET is different from DET which in the Bible is transcribed as Elohim. The word Elohim has many interpretations. Today we are going to give uh, many of them because they are related with the waters. If you read the book of Genesis, you will see that is always uh, uh, the term water is written in different chapters. But for instance, after saying, and the earth was empty and without form, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss, it is stated, and the Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters. Of course, the word Hashamim, ha -sha which is translated as heaven in the Bible, is another way of saying the superior waters. Because the word Mim, Mem, Yod, Mem, means water in Hebrew, in Kabbalah. And the word, the letter He, means the water. So, as you see here, the same word which means heaven, you find the word Mim, Hasha Mim, which means water. But the word Shin, or the letter Shin is there, indicating that the fire the prana is always in it. The letter He, as uh, you can see in the next graphic, it is stated, And Elohim said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one space. Many translations says into one place. But place or space is the same thing. But in this case, we are talking about the absolute abstract space, which is formless. So the best translation is into one space. Because in that space which is empty is where matter is going to be concrete. It is like Something that is diluted and is becoming and f having form. But it's the same thing. 
is what we call creation is nothing but a transformation of the nothingness into something. Because when we call about, uh, or we say about nothingness, or we state nothingness, doesn't mean nothing at all. It's something else, but which is not matter or energy, but that takes the shape of matter. And that is precisely what, from the space, the nothingness comes at. Every single planet and every single unity takes form in that way. We disagree with the official science that states that uh, the universe existed from one single point. That's the theory of the Big Bang, that all of a sudden exploded and the universe appeared in expansion. That's ludicrous. The, the truth is that every single unity has its beginning and its ending. It says what in the Bible is called tohu vevohu, or formless and void. So, the term hamim, the waters, contains the letter yod between the two mems. You see, there are the two mems here, mem and the mem final. Uh, type of mem that is written always at the end of the word. So, the letter Yod encompasses the tenth Sephiroth. Because the letter Yod in Kabbalah is the tenth letter of the alphabet. So, when we say Yod, we are pointing to the tenth Sephiroth automatically. So, this is how every Kabbalist sees. And Yod means Yad, hand and arm. So you see how the symbol of this uh, simple word, Yod, encompasses the hands, arms, the ten sephiroth. And then he, this is how we explain that God molded everything with his hands. But it means the ten sephiroth. That together with the three aspects of the absolute are thirteen. Is what we call the thirteen attributes of mercy. The solar, I mean the absolute abstract space is divided in three aspects. It's called Ain, Ain Sof, and Ain Sof Or. Ain means nothingness. Ain Sof means the limitless. And Ain Sof Or means the limitless light. So these three aspects together with the ten sephira that we always study is what we call the 13 attributes of mercy. Whose origin is derived from the great city who in itself is both male and female, symbolized by the letter He. In uh, previous lectures, we talk about uh, the ruined Hagal. And the previous speaker talked about <coughs> the mystery of Hagal, which is the mantam Ha. H A Ha, which is precisely the way in which the letter He is uh, the, written in Hebrew, spelled, in other words. The letter He, which is there, as you see in the graphic, spells He Aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So, it's read, as we read uh, the mantra, Ha! But in Hebrew it said, Hey! Because the letter Aleph sounds in that way. So, you see that the letter Aleph is hidden 
within the letter H. And that's why we say that the Holy Trinity, which symbolizes the letter Aleph, because it's made by three structs that we call Keter, Chogma, Bina, that letter Aleph is hidden within the He. That's why the Sohar says, And who is this city? It is the Eternal One, Ein Sof, the boundless unity, from whose breath all life, Haya, and all things. This word, things, that are spelled here, Dalet, Bet, Resh, is called Dabar, word. The same word means thin. Means that all things, all words, Devarim, have sprout from the letter He. That's a mystery. That's why when you said He, means breath. Sounds here in the throat. The letter H, the famous Rune Chagal. That's why Madame Blavatsky wrote in his secret uh, doctrine that the Ein Sof or the ray of the Ein Sof is the eternal breath, eternal breath, profoundly unknowable to itself, referring to the Ein Sof, the letter He. That's why this uh, mysterious letter appears always behind every single word as the in English. That meaning that everything proceeds, emerges from it. So this letter He is representing the abstract, absolute space, formless and void. But when it takes form, is also appearing like the He. That's why the second name of God is Yod He Vav He. Has two He's. The second He is the one that appears from the unknowable. As it is explained, all things have proceeded from it. The waters above the firmament designate this Sephiroth who came forth from the letter He, the fourth letter of the Tetragrammaton, yod he vav He, Because in other lectures we explained that the name of God, yod he vav means Keter, Chokma, Bina, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. But all of these three emanated from the fourth He, so, God in itself is Tetra, represented by the Holy Trinity, and that He. This is what in Kabbalah is called Yehida. <coughs> we talk about Yehida in previous lectures. In Kabbalah, we state that there are five souls or five types of consciousness. Yehida is the first one. Five types of cognizance. This Yehida is called the cosmic consciousness. Embraces the Holy Trinity and the abstract absolute space. That means that is manifested and unmanifested type of consciousness. Where we can find this? We find it 
everywhere in the space. What do we find in the space? Infinite galaxies, solar systems, planets, moons, comets. They are matter floating within that abstract, absolute space, within that type of consciousness, Yehida. And that means unity in Kabbalah. So when we're talking about Yod He Bar He, we are talking about that unity, which is with that limit. It's limitless. We cannot say that, that Yod He Bar He is only in this part of the universe or, or in this, uh, I mean, this earth. It is everywhere. This is how Kabbalah is explained. This is what uh, uh, the Bible calls Jehovah. But it is really translated as Yod Hava. Yod Hava, because Hava also comes from Hai, Haya, which means life. So within that Yehida is also Ya, which is the second type of soul that we were talking about in previous lectures. Haya is life. That's why when we address the letter Yod, which is just a single spot, this is how you see the letter Yod in Hebrew, spot. That Yod, the tip of it is Yehida, because that tip goes into the abstract space, and the rest is Haya, life, which is manifested in the universe. And that's why Haya, as you see, is called the breath of all life, which abides everything. That Yehida, that Haya, is here with us. Because it's everywhere. If we want to inquire, we have to meditate and to look for our emptiness. Because in the end, you see, the physical body is also emptiness. It's a space in between the atoms that are forming this physicality that we have. So that Yehida and Haya is there in potentiality. All of us are connected to it. Nothing can exist without that connection. Because this is what is the Yehida, the unity. So, The Zohar says, in order, however, to arrive at and obtain some conception through it be inadequate, through the Ein Sof, only through them, to the Sephiroth, it was necessary that they should be arranged and posited in a certain order or sequential series and relationship to each other, and thus become sequentially a reflected image of the eternal. This is then is the meaning of the words into one space. That means that that abstract space or that abstract CET, in order to manifest in the space, has to reflect his power sequentially in different steps. And those are what we call the Ten Sephiroth. Or what we call also Hashamim, heavens. Here in the third graphic you can see the Ten Sephiroth. In the left you can see the different names of God. The top Keter is called Eheye Asher Eheye. 
I become who becomes. Here is called Yod He Vav He, Yod Hava. Yod He Va Elohim is Bina. Then the word El. Elohim Gibor. Eloa o Ele Vadat Yod He Vav He. Yod He Va Sabaot. Elohim Sabaot. Shaddai El Chai. En Adonia. They call it Adoni, Adonai as well, but we better call it Adonia, which is written in the same way. Because in Hebrew, is, uh, you don't find vowels, but only lines and spots. Why is uh, uh, Adonia? Because it's a feminine sephira, Malkut. So, these are the holy names of God in the world of Atziluth. The world of the archetypes. And uh, the holy name of God, uh, in any ways, whether it's Yod Chava or any other way in which we name God, synthetically in Kabbalah we said Hashem. That means the name. Hashem. Going back into the first graphic, look the way that is written the heavens. Ha Shamim. The letter Yod and the letter Mem at the end of any word in Kabbalah means plural, masculine. So this word Ha Shamim that is translated as heaven in the Bible can be translated also as Hashem Mim. Hashem Mim. Which translated means the names. That's why in Kabbalah you can see all of that without seeing it. If we translate the Bible as all the meanings that we can find in the Hebrew word, we will we'll make volumes and volumes of the book of Genesis. Because this is really the way in which the initiates hide everything. So Hashamim, which is related as heaven, is also Hashemim, the names. And what are those names of Hashemim? Are the names that we are seeing there, as I told you, of the Ten Sephiroth and the world of Atziluth. The holy names of God, which we call heaven, and all, all of that which are in that space that we are talking about. So it said, let the waters appear in one space. That space is Atziluth, where we find heaven. So when we think Kabbalistically in heaven, we think in God, Right? But in Kabbalah, God or the deity is not a person. It's light. Diluted in, many, diluted in many archetypes, many forms. All the forms emerge from it. And this is precisely what uh, we find uh, in this graphic. That all the names together of El, which means God, because the word El appears there in this verse in Hebrew, appear in one space. And let Heyabash, Heyabash, the eternal one, appear in it. And yet he was so. Remember that in previous lectures, we stated that the Sohar states that in any place where we find the word Yehi, which is Yod He Yod, Yehi, that means the divine light that we are talking about. 
that is called darkness in the book of Genesis. Because remember that is stated. And the earth, that matter, with that form, was tohu vevohu, formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the abyss. What is that abyss? When you see the space in the night, that is that abyss that we are talking about. Limitless abyss, which is darkness. But we see just spots of light that we call stars, planets, comets, in that galaxies. In that darkness. That means that all of them sprout from that darkness. But that darkness is tohu vevohu, formless and void. And from it emerged the light, as the Bible states. So, when that dry line appears, says the Zohar, <coughs> that, li that land that is called dry land is also translated as the eternal one. That eternal one means the ten sephiroth. It's not a person. But we place here that Hindu image, which is precisely symbolizing the same thing. It is called the god Narayana. The god of the water. But it's not a god of the uh, water of the ocean or the water of the lake. It's a god of those waters which are abstract that we call Akash. And from it you see all the spheres around him are represented all the planets which are concrete manifestation of that water that is diluted in the space. So water for us, Kabbalistically speaking, is not just the liquid that we find here in this physical world. It's so called, so called Tatuapas, Akash, which is abstract. That's why Genesis talks about the, that, that water, but we have to inquire which type of water is Genesis talking about. Because that water also exists in us. So, Yehi is that light, abstract light, that manifests into the matter. That's why it says, and Yehi was so. The Bible said, and it was so. But it is Yehi, that hey, manifesting in a concrete manner. But this type of manifestation that we are talking right now is in the seventh dimension. Because the space manifests in different dimensions. We are in this three-dimensional world. The space exists in this three-dimensional world, and we see the matter in this three-dimensional world. But the matter exists in all dimensions, and that space also exists in all dimensions. It's limitless. Unfortunately, with the type of senses that we have in this physical world, it's not possible to experience or to see that space and that matter in other dimensions. That's why in alchemy we say that for us any type of element is hydrogen in different densities. And this word hydrogen also hides from the Greek language the word water, hydro. Because in order for the universe to exist, it needs hydro, water, akash, maim, as we said in Kabbalah. So, 
Ehe ashe ehe ye is precisely that energy that becomes represented by Keter, the father of all delights, represented by the ancient of days, what in Christianity we call the father who is in heaven. He is not a person. He is light. And that light is that that says, I become who becomes. That light is fire, too. But that light cannot exist if it wasn't for the mother, for the Akash, for, for the water. So that light needs the water in order to exist. And this is what we call the Ein Sof. And this is something that uh, we have to understand and comprehend. Because when we talk about water, we talk about the mother. And light. The father. Or the fire. With fire is male. Water is female. But it's a transformation of those forces from the abstract, abstract aspect into the concrete aspect. Is what the book of Genesis talks about. That's why when we talk about uh, those waters Hamim we had to address what uh, you see the fourth uh, graphic with the Sohar come the ancient of days that is represented by many Kabbalists as a gigantic, gigantic human being in order to point that is consciousness it's not that we are going to find a being like that, you know, standing on the earth and the rest of the universe on top of him. It is showing what we call and what we name Yehida, the unity. That unity is that ancient of days, represented by the ancient of days. On top of the head we find the infinite. Then any galaxy in his chest in his trunk, any solar system, and in the bottom, any planet. Means that embraces all of it. And of course, it's a standing of the water. And everything that you see there exists within the water. So he is water and energy, or is matter and energy. So, and yet he was so, means the divine light and splendor through, though refracted and reflected by the Sephiroth, is only one and the same. This mystery is also contained in the words, let the dry land appear. For by the word, hey Yabash, the earth or thy land, is signified the eternal one, the life of the world from whom from whom come forth all creatures and existences, as from the earth spring forth all flowers, fruits, and seeds. Let us now go into our own physicality in order to ask to understand why we are studying all of this. Because remember that it is written that the human being is a microcosmos of the macrocosmos. It means that everything that we find there in huge, in large, is within us, in small. It is written let the lower waters collect 
the names together of L in one space. As this happened in large, in the superior dimensions, it has to be repeated in us. Knowing that the waters are the origin and that contain all of those elements that we call the archetypes of God, we had to study the word Hamim, the waters. If you observe the graphics that we have here in this graphic, which is the six, I believe, where we find the two heads, or we will, or we will say the central nervous system, male and female central nervous systems, and the sexual organs of male and female. Those are the secrets of the word Hamim. Visualize that the word Maim, Mem, Yod, Mem means water, but Hamim means the waters. But the letter He is there indicating that the abstract aspect of those waters are also there. Because the He symbolizes the abstract, absolute space. The Run Chagal, the breath of God. Life, Haya. So, those waters divide in the human organism in two manners. The first is me, which in Hebrew means who. And we talked about that in previous lectures. But this who, backwards, means water, ocean, sea, lake. Though that refers, of course, to the central nervous system. Or better said, the fluid that we have in the central nervous system. The cerebrum spinal fluid, which is the activity of me, who, or that water in the masculine aspect. When we address the brain, whether in the feminine or masculine aspect, we are pointing to the masculine aspect of that water. That's why in other lectures we stated that the brain symbolizes Adam, the masculine aspect, or the Yad, in other words. And those precisely are the waters that uh, take in which the brain and the spinal medulla are floating and the spinal medulla and the brain which is the central nervous system is a throne of God in us And that's why the whole thing, the whole work that we always do, alchemically, is related with a spinal column. That is called the tree of life. Ot Chaim. Behold that word. Ot Chaim means the tree of lives. Haya is life, Haim, lives. But that word Haim, that means life, is written with two jots. Haim, Ot Haim. And you find the word there, 
me or water. Me means who. Backwards, yam is water, ocean, sea. And the word het, yod, is life. So all of that haim is in the spinal medulla. That's why when we say, when we talk about the 10 sephiroth, or the 13 attributes of mercy, we go into the ot haim, or the world of atzilus, the world of the archetypes, that relates in our physicality with a spinal column, the brain. We, in other lectures, explain that the brain is divided in two hemispheres. The right hemisphere is called Chochma, the left is called Bina. And the crown, the pineal gland, which is just light, is called Keter. And the rest is the habitat of that Ruach Elohim that in the beginning was hovering upon the face of the waters, according to Genesis. So the cerebral spinal nervous system is a throne of God. Hmm? Or in other words, is where God has to be seated. Unfortunately, the brain is the vehicle of the mind, the sinful mind that we have. We have to have access to that spinal nervous system and to the brain the throne of God in order for it who is me who to build what he build in large inside of us because inside of us we have a space how do we call that space well it is abstract when you close your eyes and see your subconsciousness, unconsciousness, there's darkness upon the face of that abyss. You want to make light? You want to create something inside? Well, this is the clue. Because God created from the darkness. God is there in that darkness. But in potentiality, not in activity. We want to put him into activity. Then we have to go with Ma. Because Hamim means also Ma. You see, the rest, the other letters, Mem and He, means Ma. Which is also a word that we pronounce in the beginning when we are kids, children. Ma is the first. Ma, Ma. Right? We come from it, from Ma, from the sexual fluid. Because this is the second aspect of that fluid, the sexual energy. If the positive, the father, is there in the spinal nervous system, the mother is in the sexual organs. Mm -hmm. Those are the feminine waters that are called Ma, and that in Hebrew means what? That's why in the Bible, sometimes there are questions. Who made the universe? And people, when they read this, they're thinking it's a question. No, it's an affirmation. It's saying that who made the universe? And what helped him? Hmm? And it says, what helped him to do it? No, no. is saying that what helped him to do it? Because what is ma? You see? This is the way which in which in the Bible is hidden all truths. That only the Kabbalists can see it. And ma relates to the sexual fluid. And that's why we have to state clearly. We have prostituted ma. All this humanity in this planet prostituted Ma. The Sheki Na. That wonderful light that we have in the sex. And of course, 
That's why uh, it is stated that in the beginning, God uh, creates with Lilith, Laila, the darkness, the night. But we had to take the light from the darkness, from Lilith. That's why it is stated that Adam, the brain in the spinal column, had in the beginning a wife that was Lily, Lilith, Laila, the night. Because this is how we started. When we start making this transformation, we have to start with Lila, Lilith, which is a prostitute, a degenerated woman that we made. And we have to take the light from it because that Lilith refuses to be under the power of the brain and the spinal column. In other words, this sexual degenerated type of matter that we have in the sex refuses to be controlled by the brain. That Lilith likes to control the brain. But in this path, we have to learn how to control Lilith, the sexual organs. It's not a woman, a singular woman that uh, people think, you know, as reading that literally. It relates to the Tuma, the sexual force. So those are the lower waters. You see? In us. Because Malkut is the lower level in which we are. It's at the lower waters. If we want to create that, we have to utilize this me and ma, the two lower waters that symbolize the Holy Spirit. In the next graphic, you see how the Sohar explains or other books about the word Elohim. And how uh, the book of Genesis, the translation, has to be explained in relation with the third day, which is Genesis chapter 1, verse 9. Let the lower waters collect Hamim, the names together of El, God, in one space inside of us. In order to make the miracle of the unity. It does one space means one thing. Is what in Latin says. Fiat firmamentum in medio aquarum et separate aquas of aquis, que superius secutque inferius et que inferius secutque superiors. Ad perpetranda miracula reunius. So that the miracle of one thing can appear. But we can say also, so that the miracle of the one king, Ray Unius, one king, can appear. Which is the Lamb of God. The world of Atiluth, that we call the Messiah. In us. So the word Elohim, as you see, we have explained that has many meanings. But in this lecture, we are going to explain just two meanings in order for us to understand. The word El in Hebrew means God. And we add the letter He at the end. Ella means Goddess. But also means these. Elle. Either you said Elle or these. But why is Ella, goddess, and Ella with the same letters, these? It's because these archetypes of Sephiroth are within Ella, which is the feminine aspect, the goddess. So, the rest of the letter is I am, Yod Mem, Elhim, or what we translate as Elohim. This im, you know, means ocean, sea, lake. So if we said Ela, 
Im, we said, the sea goddess. And we said, El, Haim, Haim, we said, God of the water. One is masculine, El Haim, the god of the water, or the sea goddess, Elahim. Whether you want Elahim or Elohim, the word Elohim encompasses the two forces of the water. Because the letter Mem symbolizes the water. And the letter Yod symbolizes the ten sephiroth within that water. You see how beautiful is that? Elohim. But also Elle means these. Elle, these. These what? These archetypes. Which in the Bible are translated as Israel. Israel are all those archetypes that are in the water. So when we are working with Elohim, we are working with the sea goddess, the god of the water, and these archetypes of the world of Atilut, which are in the water too. So when we are transmuting or doing what the book of Genesis says, let the lower waters mean the cerebral spinal fluid and the sexual fluid, those are the lower waters, collect Hashamim, the names together of El. El is God. Elohim, Elohim, in one space, inside of us. That means that when we are doing sexual alchemy and manipulating those waters inside of us, we had to concentrate in the superior waters. Because those superior waters are the ones that will crystallize through our lower waters into one space. In order for the dry land to appear, that dry land is a concrete matter, which will be that particular individual unity in us. This is the what, how the book of Genesis explains it, Kabbalistically, alchemically. And of course, this is why you see in the graphic the ten sephiroth and the female aspect of that Elohim in the waters, collecting it. As when the woman takes the seed of the man, the sperm within which that light is, unfortunately, making life in the animal manner. She collects that semen, that lower water, in her womb, her lower water, in order to make the miracle of one unity, one physical body. But is not with light. In the same way, individually speaking, we had to do it. And here in this graphic, where we find this uh, Buddhist graphic, <coughs> we find uh, what the Zohar states, how the waters above, which are represented by the blue Buddha there, which is called in Buddhism, Adi Buddha. Adi means light. Sanskrit. The Tadwa Adi, Tadwa of the light. Adi Buddha. 
the superior aspect of the Buddha connected with the lower aspect, which is the lower waters. The lower waters connected with the superior waters in order to make the miracle of the unity. This is related, of course, with uh, book of Genesis, as you can see there, all the, the verses that we quoted of the Bible, and that is written by Shimon ben Hohai, in which he is synthesizing the sexual alchemy. I saw the Lord seated in his throne. When you perform the sexual magic, and then all of those forces are coming together in one. And you see the Lord, which is the light, seated in his throne, in his spinal nervous system, rising. And this is how all life appears within each one of us. This is how we see God inside of us. There is a word that is coming into my mind right now. Which is Siach. Shin Yod Het Siach. That appears in the second uh, chapter of the book of Genesis. Really with plants. Plant, but also is translated at bush. Remember the burning bush? This word, uh, plant, relates uh, to that life that we had to develop. Because the word ots, which means tree, also relates to the book, to this siach, which is precisely tree, plant, bush. As we say the, in English, in many ways, in order to say the plant or tree. So, when Moses was in the type of the Mount Sinai and he saw the burning bush. There, in the dry land, because this is what we call wilderness, or desert. So in many pictures when you find that uh, all this is a dry land and the bush is there and God is appearing. Why is God appearing in the burning bush, in a bush, in a plant, in a tree? Because when you observe nature, you observe that this transformation, this alchemical outcome of this light is shown in any single tree or plant. Plant, trees, bushes, they transform that solar light in themselves and are, are, are full of beauty, fruits. The transformation of that is pure white alchemy. That don't happen with the animals. The animals spill the lower water. Whether it's an irrational animal or an intellectual animal. Releases that what lower water. But the plants, they don't do it. The elementals of the plant naturally transmute the lower waters, guided by the superior waters, which are above in the firmament, which are called angels, which manifest that superior parts of heaven. That's why the tree of life is represented by any plant, and in this case, for the burning bush. And in many lectures we tell you that the letter Shin represents the three patriarchs. 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the book of Genesis, the book of generation or transformation of alchemy, which are represented by the father, the divine soul, and the human soul, which we have inside, which is called the monad. So when the initial is transmuting the sexual energy, this spinal column and the brain becomes its own particular siach. Because the shin is there, and this het and yod means life. High life. That's why the tree of life, haim, but this backwards, siach, siach, is representing how the fire, or the three forces, idap, ingala, and shushuna, goes up into Hai and making us a burning bush, a plant where the light of God will appear. Do you read the Bible? I think that all of us here have read the Bible one time, right? Or if you see the movie, The Ten Commandments, when that light appears in front of Moses, Moshe, Mem, Shin, Hey, you see his name, means born from the water. This is something inside of us. And what is written? It is written that that light said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He named the letter Shin. I appear to these three prophets as Shaddai El Chai. Shadda, ghost. El, God of Chai, life, the living God, the ghost of the living God. And Shaddai El Chai is the name of God in the sexual organs. So I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Shaddai El Chai. And Chai is here. Chai. That's why the word plant, Siach, means life. Of the fire in us. So that is what is happening when we are transmuting. Little by little, that light of Yehida is sprouting in us and making the miracle of the unity, of the creation of that body that we want to create, which is the astral body, the light of the astros inside of us. That's why the name graphic, we uh, wrote an Elohim called the dry land earth. But that earth is a concrete manifestation of the light that we call Israel. That's why when we address Israel, we said are the archetypes inside of us in potentiality. But if we do this sexual alchemy, and reach the third day of Genesis, then that Israel will appear in a concrete manner, in a unity inside of us. Manifest in all the splendors of the world of Atziluth inside of us. Or, in other words, manifest in the Messiah inside of us. Because Yehida, the world of Atziluth, that first soul, which is cosmic, is what we call Christ. And what in Kabbalah we call Messiah. 
the soul of the universe that needs to be humanized in us. And the first step is that when that Messiah is humanized in us, in the astral body. That's why the astral body is called the crystallization of that Messiah, of that Christ in us, which is the same Israel of all the archetypes in one. So that's why it says, and Elohim called the dry land Israel, earth, and the gathering together of the waters called his seas. Well, the gathered together of the waters, as you know, are the, the forces. The waters that we are talking about here <clears throat> that gather all that light constantly. And that is transforming that, like the plants. When we sell the sea, the cosmic sea, what we see? We see what we call in Kabbalah, Makom. Makom. This is how, I don't, I won't tell you the Hebrew letters, but you will find. Makom. Begins with Mem and ends with Mem. That's single, that's magnificent. That means space, makom, space. So here in this lecture, we are talking. My words float in the makom, in the space, and you guide them. Though that is called dabar, dabarim. There's a communication here thanks to that water which is in the Makom. In the Makom you find that water that we are talking here. This is space. is a space of light. Inside of us too. Makom. So of course, when we said they gather together the waters we call his seas, this is the sea in which we are always floating. And the astral body also is surrounded by the astral light, which is that sea, with that we gather together with the transmutation. And why the sea, the astral light is really many colors. When we talk about the astral body inside, the eidolon, is that concrete matter in us that floats in the sea of light, or the universal spirit of light. That we said esoterically. And Elohim, when it says Elohim, who, who Elohim? The female Elohim, the masculine Elohim, and the together, all the Elohim together. Saw so that it was good. This is when we really finish the second day in us. Because in the second day we explain. There is not, and it was good. Because this is still not concrete in us. There is no unity in us. But here, this is good. With the astral body. And here you see, this is the astral body that we call Israel, that symbolizes also for the 12 zodiacal signs, for the Shushana of all the archetypes of light that is explained in Kabbalah. Which is the rose, the rosy cross. If you ask, why is this earth called Israel? Because sometimes it says Eretz, it says Eretz, the earth. Ha Eretz is, is Israel. But when people read, oh, Eretz is Israel. They explain, all oh, the people that live in the Middle East, in the Mediterranean, they call Israel. Yeah, the people in the Mediterranean call Israel, the state of Israel there, you know, in the Middle East. But Kabbalistically, we are not talking about that. When we talk about Kabbalah, we are not referring to those people. Those people that inherited this knowledge, and I don't know if they are practicing it. But in Kabbalah, we address that inside. 
has nothing to do with the outside. That is Israel. And that is explained in the book of Exodus. That's why we quoted Exodus 14, chapter 21. When what we are explaining here is explained, but in other words, it says here, in Moshe, or Moses, it has the man and the sheen there, the lower and superior waters together with the hay, you see, that word, that's why when you said Moshe, we said Moshe is something inside, particular. It is written in the book of Kabbalah that in the time of the end, Moshe has to return, has to come to his people. But this Moshe is an archetype that we have to develop. The people of Moshe are the people that transmute, that put in activity willpower, telema inside but transmuting the sexual energy that is the people of Moshe of willpower he says and Moshe stretch out his yad what do you understand for that the letter yod right he says well stretch also his arm his hand This is what we all understand. But esoterically we said, Yod, hey, vav, hey, means Yod, phallus, hey, uterus, vav, man, hey, woman. So when it says that Moshe stretched out his yad, means his phallus. Because he's performing alchemy inside of us. And Moshe will power in us, stretch his yad, his phallus. Above the sea, Haim. And we find here masculine and feminine together. Me and Ma. Because this Mem final goes with the Yod and goes with the He. Me, Ma. How do you stretch that phallus or that willpower? Well, in the sexual act, connected. When the woman and the men are connected sexually, Moshe is stretching his yad, his willpower. In this case, as a man, his phallus over the lower waters, which in this case symbolizes the woman. Because he symbolizes the superior waters. He has a sheen there, which symbolizes Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, or Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And also in the lower aspect, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. All the forces of heaven together working with the waters. And yod he vav he which is laid at Jehovah, cause the sea to go back by Ruach, which is laid as a strong east wind. Who is this Ruach? The Ruach Elohim that was hovering in the beginning upon the face of the waters is our own particular spirit, our own particular angel, our own particular El, God. So in other words, Moshe, willpower, is acting there in the sexual act in order not to spill, to transmute the sexual energy. By the grace of Moshe, the willpower, but... The Ruach Elohim is the one that is acting under the commands of Jehovah. Hmm? And you know what Yod Hebab here already explained, represent the superior forces. And the Ruach Elohim is our own spirit. That's why in the sexual alchemy, we have to be concentrated in our own particular spirit. We say we have to remember our self. That self is our spirit. Don't confuse that. Remember yourself. You have to remember your lust, your anger, your laziness, and all of that filthiness that we have within. We don't have to remember that. We have to forget about that. In the sexual alchemy, you have to remember God because God, the Ruach Elohim, is the one that floods and makes the miracle of transmutation, the miracle of the unity to happen within us. That's why it was written there. 
and made of the sea a sword. The Bible says a dry land. But this means a sword. Which means the fire that rises here in the spinal medulla is the flaming sword and the waters were divided. The polluted waters from the pure waters are divided. We explained that in the second day of Genesis already. And the children of Israel, which means all the archetypes that we were invoking from the superior worlds that are really being concrete in the initiate, went into the midst of the sea upon dry land, upon the astral body, we will say. When you imagine this, when you read this, you think, oh yeah, well, a lot of people coming out of Egypt and going and crossing the Red Sea. No, this is not the meaning of it. This is alchemy. That means all the archetypes of light coming from above and united from the lower waters are going according to the willpower, Moshe, Telema, going in the midst of the two waters. Because there's your life inside the right water, the left water, going into the midst. Into the dry land, mean in that land that is being concrete, that is being created, that is called the astral body. And the waters were a wall unto them, unto their right and hand, and to, on, their, on their left hand. Right and left, like a wall. That is something that happens in sexual alchemy. Because when you are connected, sexually speaking, then the astral body is born. And you feel yourself floating in that akash. Because the sexual energy is akash. The makom, the space in which you are, is also akash. This is the akash here in the space, in this emptiness, in this void that we find here between you and me. That's why Master Samael on Veor stated that we have to be here now, aware of that light. Subject, my consciousness, that is subject. Object, everything that surrounds that light, which are concrete aspects that we see around, in space or location, makom. You see, it is be, just being aware of that light, being aware of that consciousness, to expand it. To be accustomed to be what we are, consciousness. Because this is precisely what we are, consciousness. But in the lower aspect, to expand that, to become cosmic, is the goal. But this is by step by step. First, we have to make concrete that light in us in order for us to float. That's why the astral body is called the body of Christ. In us, which is made by the body of Christ in us, which is the sperm and ovum, which is the semen, the sexual matter. By uniting those waters from above and below, and to make the miracle of that unity in us. This is what is alchemy. And this is what you find here the astral body appearing there. With the astral light. And this is how the miracle of the unity is done in us. The last graphic, where you find Siach. Siach, you see, this is how you read it. And this is what Moses saw the burning bush, hear the Siach, the light of the fire shining there. And this is what we become. That's why we find there the two astral forces, the astral body, the female and masculine, uh, depends on what sex we are. But in, indeed the astral body with this androgynous contains the two fires. And Elohim said, let the dry earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, 
and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and Yehi was so. Remember that Yehi is the light. The grass is that energy or that aura, we will say, it, that surrounds the astral body. That's the grass, according to our own personality, our own idiosyncrasy. Because everybody that creates that body, that astral body, has different type of aura, different type of energy. That's why it says, and the herb yielding seed. In other words, that is, pertains to us, that we are going to have a particular seed or sperm, that plant, herb, will appear into us in different ways. The fruit tree, yielding fruit. The fruit are two types, two times named there because it is a feminine fruit and a masculine fruit after his sex. Kind, mina, is mean, sex in Kabbalah. So in other words, the man will create a seed, a fruit, according to his kind. And the woman also will create that seed according to, his, to her kind, to her own sexuality, because each one are different. We have different type of sexual energy, or lower waters, in other words. And in the astral body appear different. That means that each one of us, we have an astral body, but each body will be different. It's not that we are going to be, how you call conning? Equal? Cloning, right? Imagine the same face, the same uh, features. No. Each one astral body is different. Because in the actual body, we have our own particular Israel, which is the inheritance, the life that we inherit from the light. Each master is different. It's not equal. Even coming from the same ray, every monad is different. It's here when, for the first time, we receive the name Hashem, of our own particular monad. That name is in relation with the light, is in relation with the mystery of each one of us. And yet he was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb, yielding seed after his sexual force, after his kind. Remember that. Kind means sex. And it's easy to, to see it. Different kinds of human beings is according to the seed. Now, if one seed is connected with another kind, we make another kind, right? Like in this uh, day and age, the mixture of races, different kinds of races make different kinds. But each one of us, internally, related with our own particular father, which is in heaven, is a kind of person. Here, that light crystallizes according to our own kind, there are seven mighty rays of creation. And in that seven mighty lights of creation, we find many monads, many spirits that have different attributes, different things, spiritual speaking, words. So each one of us will crystallize that astral body according to their own kind, sexual force. This is what the Bible talks about. Hmm? And God saw that it was good. You see, it's repeated again. This, and God saw that it was good, is related with, and the evening and the morning were the third day, the third initiation of major mysteries, the, astral, the creation of the astral body. That means that that was good. But before that, there was another good too. So the third day contains... Two times, and God saw that it was good. Because in the third day is where we make good the second day, and the third day itself. In other words, if you reach the second initiation of major mysteries, 
you are okay, but not good. Only when you reach the third initiation, then you are good. Two times. Because then, then you are out of the law of the intellectual animal. Because you have a created an immortal body. That is a solar body that relates to the solar laws, which are the immortal laws. And then if you die physically, it doesn't matter. You're immortal already because you have an astral body. You're good. So, of course, that's just the beginning of the first dry land that appeared. Because it has to appear three times. But that's the mystery of the third day. And if you have questions, we can spend more because I have too much information in my brain. <laughs> but I don't remember all of it. Yeah? Uh, all the archetypes you said are Israel, right? Yeah. Yeah. But they're also everywhere else, right? Or does it deposit itself basically? The question is the archetypes Israel go into Hod, which is the astral body. But they are also everywhere. Well, when we said go is everywhere in, in relation with of, of course with the world of Atziluth, with Yehida. Right? Israel really represents all of the unities, of the big unity, which is called Yehida, which in sentences is called yod he vav he right? That Israel, it we explain the meaning, is Is, which reminds us Isis, the feminine aspect. Ra, the solar light, and El, which is God. So it is all the masculine and feminine aspect of El, of God, inside of us. That is Israel. Mm -hmm. And all those parts of Israel are different in each one of us. This is how Kabbalah is explained. Israel is Israel, but will crystallize in each one of us according to our own level, according to our own consciousness, our own ray. And they are, of course... This Israel are everywhere. It relates to the world of Achiluth or the 13 attributes of mercy, Yehida, in the universe, Kabbalistically speaking. Because that aspect or many aspects of, of the deity is everywhere. Of course, in other religions, they call these aspects in another name and other words. But we're talking about here about the Bible. The, Kabbalah explains Israel, because in the Bible, when you read Israel, Israel, the chosen ones, right? And you said, oh, the chosen ones are in the Middle East, uh, there in, in, in the Mediterranean. No, they're not talking about that. The chosen ones will be over the chosen one, which is the archetypes of Israel. They are the chosen ones. From the beginning, Israel was in the womb of God, because they are the attributes of light. According to the Kabbalah, according to the Bible, according to the Zohar. And of course, as I said, talking about here in biblical terms, in the way of Moses. But in other religions, these archetypes are named in different ways. That you have to understand. Anyhow, our own particular Ruach Elohim, Ruach. Elohim takes those attributes in itself, or we will say it better, the Elohim plays with our own particular Ruach Elohim, those attributes, or those 13 attributes of mercy within our own mercy, which is Chesed, 
the Ruach Elohim. That mercy, Ruach Elohim, contains those attributes and their name, Neshama, which is another soul, right? We talk about Yehida, cosmic. Haya, cosmic too. But Neshama, which comes from that cosmic force, is individual in each one of us. That Neshama contains those attributes of Israel in the Ruach. You see? Neshama, Ruach, and we are Nefesh. So this Neshama are within our own particular Ruach. Or what we say in Sanskrit, Budi is within Atman. Atman Budi means one. Ruach and Neshama are one. They're in the superior aspect of our monad. So that Neshama is the inheritance of the Elohim in us. You know, when somebody dies here physically, and you go, and the inheritance of that millionaire is going to be distributed according to his own will. <coughs> right? So he distributes one million for you, ten cents for him. It's his own will. Right? That's Neshama. And that Neshama is in our own superior spirit. Whether it's ten cents or one million, whatever it is, it's just as we are here uh, making a similitude, right? But it's light. When we start developing that Neshama in us, and then we see our own particular inheritance that develops in the astral body, in the mental body, in the causal body, and all of that attributes. That's why all the masters are different. You want to see the attributes of Jesus of Nazareth, then read the Pistis Sophia, dictated by him to his disciples. It's a wonderful book. But here we are talking about Genesis, that is attributed to Moses, Moses, right? Which is pure Kabbalah. Well, it's explained because Pistis Sophia and Book of Genesis is the same, but in different words. The light of Jesus is, of course, more intense. And the light of Moses is also intense, right? Because there is more. But I'm doing here efforts to explain, you know, what I see, which is too much. But sometimes I say, how am I going to explain these people about this? And I'm doing efforts here. Because I understand and I see more, but I said, if I said what I saw, I don't know if you want to understand. Because I have experienced that in that, yeah? So you said when, when you practice the sexual alchemy that you must focus on the higher waters. But that the higher waters are, are an abstract. Are there practical examples that you can give of it? Well, when we practice alchemy, is a question we have to concentrate in the higher waters, in Hashamim, in other words, or Hashamim, the heaven. But remember that Hashamim, Hashem, backwards is Moshe, eh? which is willpower that controls that superior waters. And the one that controls it, according to what we were reading here, right, when he's explaining about the the book of Exodus. Moshe is working with the waters. Mm -hmm. Extending his yod means his phallus, his transmutation. But yod chava, which is the superior waters, is acting through ruach, which is our own particular spirit. So in other words, if we make the connection, we are here a soul, a consciousness, part of neshama. Because now neshama, or those attributes are sent to the earth in order to develop, and that is what we call our consciousness. We are in this physical body, and we have to develop those archetypes. But the one that does it is the Ruach, Elohim, under the command of Jehovah. So we concentrate in our own Ruach, our own spirit, our own God inside, 
which is automatically connected to Yod Haba, Elohim, up there. And Moshe has to be there. Because Moshe is with power. If Moshe is not there, not, no miracle will happen. If you read the Exodus, you will see that Moshe is the one that controls all the forces of nature. That's with power in us. The forces of nature are within us. You want to liberate Israel from their slavery, means the elements, the archetypes that we have, which are submitted to the mechanical laws of nature, the lunar mechanical nature, animal forces. We, had, we, we need Moshe, which is willpower. And little by little, that Moshe, which is always born as a baby, because when we start doing this work, Moshe is a baby. He's not going to appear with a long beard and with the <laughs> tablets of the law in his hand. No. He's going to be a baby. And he's going to be in danger because the Pharaoh wants to kill all the babies. All those that are transmuting. Right? But uh, if we study the book of Exodus, we will see how uh, Moshe was secretly hidden and nursed by the daughter of the Pharaoh, which is a symbol of the forces that we are working with, and that Moshe will grow, or will grow, I mean, in Egypt, which means Mizrahim, the physical body, and little by little become adult. That's transmutation, more transmutation, more transmutation, until it will appear strong and make that division of waters. But in the beginning, we start making light in the darkness. Very slow. When we talk about this dark in the darkness, I remember one experience. When I see this, about that space. And I say that the space exists in any dimension. So I was in meditation, and I was trying to submerge myself. I was, many times I submerge into that space, experience many things. But this particular experience is very significant, related with this lecture. I was taken from my own spirit into that abstract, absolute space. And I was hovering there, floating in that space. Completely dark, pitch black. Turning around me in all directions, I didn't see anything. Nothingness. The only thing that was there was myself being concrete. And I was analyzing why I didn't see anything here, only darkness. But I understood that dark darkness was light. That I was incapable of seeing. As when you put too much light in front with a flash of light in front of your eyes, you are just how you call dazzling. You don't see anything. And that light is for the physical lights, or in this case, even for my internal eyes. Darkness. Then I understood. In order to see this light, and to see what is this in this abstract space, which is darkness, upon the abyss, I had to die psychologically. And to liberate my own Israel, my own archetypes, and only to make light in the darkness, and to be with my consciousness at the level of that cosmic consciousness. Because that cosmic consciousness that is called Yehida was darkness for me. Why? Because I have another darkness within me, which is the ego. So I had to annihilate the darkness, take the light of that, and develop that vision, which is intuition. And be capable of seeing that light. The only thing that occurred to me in that state was to pray to my Divine Mother. But the Divine Mother in her aspect of death. And I said, my Divine Mother, please heal me. Annihilate me. Because I need to be one with this cosmic consciousness. But I'm here experiencing it, but not diluted in it. And of course, to die is the best. This is what we had to do. Because the Divine Mother death can annihilate you. But in a systematic manner. 
It will be wonderful. It will kill you in one spot, right? In one shot. No. You had to extract the light little by little in order to expand the light. And to expand the light means comprehension, consciousness, mastery. You see, mastery is not a matter of how you said, uh, or showing off yourself. Mastery is consciousness. It's awakening. In different levels, different degrees. Hmm? Comprehension, analysis. And in order to create an astral body, you need to do that in your own level. And continue. Because in the initiation are many levels. Many degrees. Do you have another question? Ask. How do we stop spilling semen if we've been doing it for so long? How do we get enough energy applied to bevel the thing? And even practice it for parents? That's a good question, right? Well, how do we stop spilling the semen? That takes a lot of patience. Because we have to fight against our own nature. We are accustomed to spill the semen. Because we are animals. Here we are trying to become human beings into the image of God, which is light. And to stop that, we had many exercises. In the book of the yellow book, written by the Master Samael, he explains different exercises in order to tight the sphincters that spill that force out in the physical world, like animals, the orgasm. And of course, we have to be patient and to do it because the physical body is accustomed to spill. With the practices of pranayama, sexual alchemy, and many other exercises that we find in the website, in the books of the Master Samael on Veor, we learn little by little, we teach the physical body how to obey us. Because remember, that the physical body is a child of Lilith, darkness. Lilith is a fornication, fornicator. So by teaching the physical body, we control Lilith. And eventually Lilith will withdraw from us. Because the animal aspect of us, Lilith, doesn't want to obey the superiors. This is, this is written. And that, that's what that woman, or that's, that sinful nature, has to leave. But we have to expel it little by little. We have to be patient. Because all physical body is Lilith. All our psyche is Lilith. Remember that in the psyche we have also Lilith and Nahema. Two prostitutes. And to teach those prostitutes to be chaste, but that is a task for Mary Magdalene. You have another question? There are many types of darknesses. We're talking here about the type of darknesses of the absolute, which are divine darknesses. Which is different, obviously, than... They're different from our own particular darkness, but it, it relates to it. Yeah. Because our own darkness is egotistical darkness, and we have to make light from those darknesses. It relates to it in the lower aspect, we will say. Another question here? What are the physical signs along the journey? The what? Physical signs along the journey. Well, uh, one sign, we will say only one, is that when you are doing this, eventually you are becoming uh, self-cognizant of yourself. And that comes with that light. When the light is released, when chastity is uh, done, then we uh, develop that self-cognizance. It's, it's instant remembering of God, of oneself, from moment to moment. It's easy. That's one of the signs that you can see. In the beginning, because we are fornicators, that's difficult, right? To remember God and to stay here and now. But when you are in chastity, and you are transmuting your sexual energy, that develops little by little. And becomes easy. Because God is that light. 
and then we develop. Yeah. You talked about the ten names of God in Nancy Lou. Mm -hmm. Are there ten names in the other worlds also? Oh yeah. In the world of Atsilu, there are the ten names of God, but uh, the other names uh, of the Sephiroth mm -hmm. in other worlds imply uh, other aspects of God too, but not as perfect as the world of Atsilu. Because in the world of Atsilu, you find the ten names, names of God, and there is not Klipoth there. In other words, there is no hell. Everything is divine. But in the world of Bria, then comes the other names of the archangels, which are always polarized in the positive and negative. Those are what they call the demiurgos, or the demiurge, which acts positively in, in the animal manner, because are the angels that control the forces of nature, of creation, which are in us. <coughs> and then in the world of uh, Yetziah, the world of the legions of angels, we're not going to name them because there's, you can find that in, in the website. And of course, physically, you find also the 10 names of, of the 10 Sephiroth in relation with the solar system. Hmm? The world of uh, Asia or Asa, Asia. Can we crystallize the internal bodies just with uh, uh, pranayama? No. But you can uh, liberate a lot of light from your archetypes with a single, as a single person and to receive enlightenment but an elemental. Submitted always to the lunar mechanical process of the will of Zamzara but awaken. Because in order to be out of the will of Zamzara, you have to create immortal bodies. Because we are submitted to this will of Zamzara because we have lunar bodies. Our physicality is lunar. The protoplasmic bodies called Kamarupa and Budimanas inside of us are lunar. So it belongs to nature. If we work with those bodies, which are lunar, but in the positive manner with pranayama, etc., you will awake, of course, and develop a lot of cities, solar powers, like Yogananda did. But will remain in limbo, the first sphere of hell, awaken. And we have the opportunity to return into this physical world in order to work with sexual alchemy. Because in order to create the internal bodies, you need the two waters. Hmm? Me and Ma, hmm? Hamim, cannot work with the two, you see. That's why we explain that Yehida is Hashamim, the waters from the space. But these waters divide in two. There are the creative waters of the Holy Spirit, called Shiva Shakti, hmm? in us. Or oh, my and me, me and ma. So, in the physical world here in which we are right now, we are divided into sexes. Physically, our physical body, even though we have the two polarities, we are polarized masculine. And the woman is feminine. You want to create physically? Well, if a woman wants to have a child, she needs a sperm. She has all the power to create life in her body. But without a sperm, she cannot do it. So she needs the assistance of the men, even if she hates the men. Because there are many women that hate men. But they need a sperm in order to be pregnant. And they says, oh, I go to the bank. <laughs> in this day, they do it, right? And they ask for somebody that masturbated. Filthy thing. But they get it. We're pregnant. So they need the male force. Like, why is the man? You know? So it is not possible to create life without the two gametes. 
o gamit, is how you call it, right? There's no way. Same spiritually. You want to develop? Well, you need, if you're a man, you need a woman. You don't like women? Well, it's a problem. Because you should like women. That's normal. When men like women and women like men, that's normal. But when you start not liking the opposite sex, that's a problem. That is your problem, not our problem. You know? And you have to work with it. You have to start liking it, the opposite sex, which is the normal thing, in order to enter into the esotericism. Because the door of heaven is sex. The lower waters. This is how God comes from above and crystallizes in the lower waters. We want to make light, take light from the waters. You see, water is a conductor of energy, of electricity, you know that. In order to have life, even scientifically, they said, it is the necessity of water, hydro, right? So the same in us, we want to create this and develop the human being inside. We need, as a man, a woman, and a woman, a man. Otherwise, we don't do it. We develop at a certain level as an elemental. But we will be submitted always to samsara, not to heaven. You want to go to shamayim? Ah, you have to create the solar bodies. You have to do this. Otherwise, you won't. Yeah. Yetzirah. Yes. The world of Yetzirah. In the invocation of Solomon, which is the question, you name the world of Yetzirah, the world of Bria, and the world of Atziluth. It's a beautiful invocation that is written there in the website and in many books of the Master. Right? Powers of the kingdom be ye under my left foot and in my right hand. That's how it, it ends, how it begins, I mean, and continues. Right, invoking all the forces of the worlds of Kabbalah because they are in the water and we are the water. How much water we are? 70%. Don't forget that. We are water. And the woman is water and the man is water. Me and Ma. From the waters we take everything. Physically or internally. Is there another question here? Redemption. You can talk about redemption. Redemption of what? Well, to redeem us from the lower loss of nature, because we are slaves of this nature. And uh, the Messiah, Christ, is the one that helps us to redeem us from sin, right? That means that in order to overcome the darkness that we have within, we had to release the Messiah within us in different levels. Different levels. I'm talking here only about the level in which he becomes concrete in us, in the astral body. That is called the internal Christus, mediator. That uh, is a mediator between our physical personality with the supreme immanence of the solar father. Yehida. So when he becomes concrete there, it's more opportunity for us to redeem us from, from sin. Because we are slave of the animal kingdom. All that animality that we have here, that is called the seven capital sins. And that we have to be free of. And we are free of that through alchemy through meditation and to compassion. It's a work that we have to perform in order to redeem ourselves from the lower kingdoms and to enter into the kingdom of God, to be born again. Should we use sexual magic every day and pranayama? Should we perform sexual magic every day and pranayama? Yeah, of course, pranayama, we can do it every day. Sexual magic, I don't know. Because that depends on the will of your wife. <laughs> if you are married. Right? The man is active, positive, right? It's always ready. Every time. The Master Samael says every day. Well, the woman says, he said that, but I am not in the mood. Sorry. <laughs> right? 
you have to conquer that. You have to understand the feminine aspect of this, this matter, right? And also, you have to understand the three, uh, how do you say, temperaments, in other words. Three temperaments, sexually speaking. It's cold temperament, warm temperament, and hot temperament. When the couple that are married are hot temperament men and hot temperament women, that's heaven. <laughs> when the couple is warm and warm, that is like they say like a purgatory, right? <laughs> but hell is calling cold, you see? They're called temperaments, that they practice sexual magic. I mean they don't feel it. They don't feel it. You have to follow the your own nature. The problem is, if you read the Parsifal Unveil by Samael Unveil, explain that the best union is the temperament with the same temperament. But when you find that the man is hot and the woman is cold, there is not uh, harmony there. Or the, the woman is hot and the man is cold, and then you have to go with it. That's your own karma, in other words. Right? But uh, the best... A perfect matrimony is hot with hot, warm with warm, cold with cold. And the intensity of the work is also according to your own temperament. When you are in this practice, you discover if you have temperament, one hour is more than enough. Sometimes you want more. Warm temperament, but cold, sometimes it's 50 minutes, it's, this is it. You want more, so... You, what can you do if your body is what the, your body asks? Right? So you have to study that. Study your temperaments. And of course, don't fight. Because sexual magic is enjoyable. It's not something that you, say you have to sacrifice. No, once you learn how to transmute, it's enjoyable. Because the sexual act is, is a privilege for the human being. It has to be enjoyable. First, you begin as an animal, and you are utilizing that energy until you are like a saint. That brings into my memory uh, Master Samael Onveor. We were visiting him in Mexico, and we brought him many disciples that were beginning. And this woman there, single, was, of course, eager to marry, asking for a husband. And then talked to the master. How do I do? What do I do in order to get a husband? Because really, I want to practice. <coughs> then the master answered and said, Okay, so you want to practice sexual magic, right? Yeah. With a man like, for instance, he says, that will be only connected with you. Sexually speaking, with a lot of energy. But on top of you, not moving, only transmuting. And you there too, doing the same thing. Oh no, I don't want that. Why? This is how it is when the man is saint. You don't want a saint then. You want a devil like you. <laughs> right? And this is precisely. When you are a devil, you have to have another devil. But there are devils that fake being saints. And they think that they have to be like very holy there in the sexual act. Well, you are, you are transmute, be chaste. Control your lust. A little by little, you will reach that level in which, like a saint, just connected without any movement, does enough in order to have sexual activity, in order to control the act. But in the beginning, there is a, is a problem because you are accustomed to fornicate. And of course, uh, uh, you have to start as a disciple. Don't start as a master. Because then you end as a disciple. <laughs> you have another question? This is it. No more questions here. Thank you very much. <laughs> to learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. 
You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.